Alrighty, so before we dive right in, just going to update you all with a little bit of what I've been up to this week. Some walks with Bambi, listening to Tim Ferriss podcast with Naval uh, Ravikant. Uh, so I actually went back and listened to the very first one that they did together. And I'll link it down below just because I did find that it, it still rang true uh, for a lot of things. And also I've listened to a more recent episode with Tim and Naval. And it's interesting to see how Naval's growth has shifted, but how, you know, his core values have stayed the same. So pretty interesting there. I also <laughs> found myself doing a study with me, uh, except I was doing work. Uh, so I was essentially studying with uh, this person, a um, med student, senior med school student from um, that's studying in Toronto. And he had a really nice setup and the music he was listening to was great. And he was also doing the Pomodoro effect, so like the 45 on, 15 off. And I really liked it. It was nice and motivating. So I don't know if you're finding yourself a little low on the mo, uh, why don't you, why don't you check it out? I will also link it down below. Okay, uh, you may be wondering about our thumbnail. Our thumbnail, where did that Udi uh, come from uh, and those lovely corgis? So thank you, Allie, shout out Allie for <laughs> sending that in. Uh, we were at our bi-weekly huddle. Yeah, this 6X Udi, so like a hoodie with the, of the H, and it, oh, yeah, you have, you just have to see it. I'll flip it up on screen right now uh, as well because it is amazing. So I shared it with permission. Uh, Ali said, absolutely. Let's dig into these questions, everybody. Okay, futures, forwards, and options. What is the difference? Okay, so what are the similarities first? Well, they're all derivatives. So they are all derivatives. They pass that three criterion test which we discussed about, I think it was in the first video, the first topic video. Um, so futures, I always think about futures and forwards, the two F ones as the ones that are hard to differentiate. So I'll hold those for a moment and I'll skip towards the options. So options, as the word indicates, they're something that we can use, but we don't have to because they are options. They are, they have an underlying financial contract you know, hence why they're a derivative. And there's something that we can execute at some predetermined date, at some predetermined price in the future. So we have our regular options and then we have our put options. So our regular options are our discretion to exercise, whereas our Per, uh, in order to purchase shares and our put options are the exact opposite. So in the future, we have the ability to make somebody purchase them from us. So put them on somebody else and they make them purchase our shares. So the regular options is our option to purchase and the put options are our option to make somebody purchase from us. So what do we want to happen with regular options? Well, we want to purchase the option or you know earn it through a stock option. Um, such as employment and then we say the exercise price and the option price are the same the exercise price are the same then we want the we want the underlying share to go up in the future because our exercise price will remain the same we want it to go up and up and up so that when we exercise we get to exercise at say at 10 and the share price went up to 25 that's like free $15 worth of money Right, and it's our options so or our option to exercise. Now, if our, say it was ex, or pardon me, it was issued, and our option price was at ten, and then it went down, it went down and down and down, and um, so would we exercise our option to purchase? No. However, if they were put options, and the uh, exercise was ten dollars, and the share price went down and down and down and down to five, would you? exercise that put option to make somebody, to put that option on somebody where they would have to purchase your shares at the exercise price? Yeah. Yeah, you would. So with put options, if you're the holder of the put options, you want it to go down. Guys, here's my little hack. I understood really good, like really good like that English, on how regular options worked. You know, how does it work if it goes up and up and up? And then I tested it out. I was like, okay, if put options are just the opposite of option options, uh, would everything be the reverse? Yeah. So get really good with regular options and understand put options are just the opposite. 
Okay, um, futures and forwards. So they act very similarly, except uh, futures, so both of them are um, the ability to exercise and get um, commodities or, or the delivery of, um, you know, cash at a predetermined rate at some time in the future, except these are not options. These are contracts that must be exercised. So, if you, so the main thing that I think of both futures and forwards, how are they similar? They are the right, um, for me, the, the obligation to deliver something in the future that you can't get out of. Uh, the difference being futures can be uh, traded on a futures exchange, forwards cannot. Uh, you can have futures, forwards and options, those are all derivatives, but the underlying assets do not, and derivatives are financial instruments, however, the underlying asset does not need to be financial. So it can be financial, so like cash, options, or maybe non-financial, like grain. I'm going to link down below where we had a pretty decent sized video explaining the difference between uh, futures, forwards, and options. But I So, um, next question. An employee has stock options and there's a sharp drop after issuance. So I'm an employee, I uh, get all these lovely stock options, it's you know my first day on the job, I just got this great promotion and I have all these lovely stock options for the company that I'm working for and I'm like, I'm pumped, I'm like this is my company, I'm going to make them rich, <laughs> they're going to make me rich, I have a third of my options vesting this year, pardon me, a third of them vesting immediately, a third of them vesting next year, and a third of them vesting in my second year, so this is fabulous money in the bank this is such a good company insert tech insert uh cannabis insert uh bitcoin here um and i'm not laughing at bitcoin i'm just saying that like you know this is my bank and all of a sudden the next day uh something hits the the news wire something hits something and um the stock goes down so great now i have um options at an exercise price of one dollar and the share is trading at five cents so the question is how does this impact the employee okay well first of all i'm sad and i'm pissed and um this is no good we got, we got a long ways to go to go from five cents to a dollar before i'm even you know remotely excited about you know striking it rich uh, not to mention that I'm also probably pretty upset that the company that I'm working for may no longer be here in the future, or at least it's not doing as good as it used to be doing. Um, can there be a change to make up for the loss? So, a couple trains of thought here. First of all, is there really a loss? Is there really a loss? I mean... It's like anything, you make the best decision that you can with the information that you have at the time. So when I, as the employee, signed up for this, that I did so because, you know, I thought I was going to strike it rich. The next day, stuff changes. So it's like anything else with the company. Could they decide to issue um, more options at a lower price? Could they choose to um, compensate you in other ways? Sure. But in all likelihood, is the company whose stock just tanked a bunch since issuing you stock options likely to be able to do something like that? And are you in the position to be asking for something like that? If anything, you should, when you sign an employment deal, um, if you are able to support, meaning if you're bringing in a value and you're able to communicate that through past experience and past wins for the company who's signing you, <sighs> negotiate that. You know, negotiate it in. Negotiate, um, it's your employment contract. Uh, so, you know, um, negotiate what happens if the share price falls. Can you do that? Well, you can do basically anything in an employment contract. More often than not, what I actually see is termination clauses. So, for example, a uh, true story. Um, I know I know one individual who made more money in two years from being terminated from companies, um, actually twice as much money from being terminated from companies than actually working for them. So just to be careful here, uh, this person um, left a company 
and um, prior to leaving they had negotiated terms with a new company uh, and they had shared their previous uh, employment contract or maybe I don't I'm fuzzy about the legal details of course um, but they negotiated the new contract in such a way that um, they had, and part of their termination had to do with like one year severance plus all the forfeited uh, stock options that had not vested yet so get this they were stock options that had not vested. We think of vesting as this, the passage of time whereby you earn them. So they essentially got, not essentially, they did substance over form. They got paid out in the form of taking um, unearned compensation, unearned vesting uh, options from their previous company, rolled them into the termination clause. They also negotiated a pretty sick signing bonus and um, I think, yeah, a year's worth of salary or two years worth of salary if they were severed. Like this is all being negotiated in their employment contract for if shit doesn't work out and they have to get fired. So pretty darn sweet. So they looked into the crystal ball, they negotiated this um, sweet uh, employment contract and look, you know, 10 months into it, this person wasn't as good as they said they were, wasn't as good as, you know, perhaps prior experience had lended to be, and they were terminated, and they walked away with well, um, well in excess, I believe it was well in excess of $250,000, which is a pretty nice sum to be told not to come to work, okay? And um, previous, you know, I'll just call them rumors, sharp rumors, um, was that this wasn't the first time that that had happened in as many as two years. So, you know, decent gig if you can get it. Um, anyways, yeah, moving on. So, that also touches on another, a uh, few other students, uh, lots of questions about stock options, and I like this. We talk about defined benefit pensions in uh, a few chapters as well as defined contribution pensions and pensions are another form of employee compensation. What is employee compensation? It's ways in which we motivate employees to work in the same way as you know the company. We want everybody's motivations to be in line to make money for the company, to make money, um, if it's a public company, for the shareholders. So if we have everybody's incentives in line in the same uh, moving in the same manner, then we can align employee incentives to work really hard to make everybody money, including themselves. Stock options are part of that. So I was a company, I was part of a company and I had, uh, I was awarded stock options in addition to uh, my salary and, you know, office, parking, the whole rigmarole. And yeah, I felt it. Like I wanted the company to succeed. Um, I wanted it to succeed because I wanted to learn things. I like the company. I like what we stood for, but I also definitely um, wanted to have that sweet payout at the end. So lots of questions. Well, what happens if the, the price goes up? Happy employee. What happens if it goes down? Not so happy employee. Um, but as um, a person who talked to me about one or two days after I was issued stock options said, um, they have a whole office that could be wallpapered with stock options in their 30 year career that were never worth anything. And then I've known people who their first company that they worked for, they you know worked hard, sort of a smaller company, and yeah, they got some stock options. And then you know six months, eight months, 12 months, 18 months later, their company was bought up. Um, within the deal, the stock options were uh, exercised and they walked away with over a million dollars. So, you know, they're like little lottery tickets in a sense. Okay. A uh, lot of questions for the CPA way. So lots of littler questions to do with like bits and parts of it. So overall, I heard really good things um, that you are feeling more confident with your CPA way ability and that like, oh darn, I just didn't advise the right way or I didn't, you know, anticipate this or that. I would say, especially with the advise part, that's a little bit of the free for all, you know? What is that above and beyond? Always get into that mindset. You know, you were asked to solve a problem with your assess, analyze, and conclude, and your advise is like that, that cherry on the top. You know, hey, I know you asked me for all this, and I solved that, and they delivered, and you're welcome, but like, here's something else you should think about based on these findings. Um, these are some of, not only are they consistent with the CPA way, but they are consistent with how I've had my, when I was consulting, my invoice overpaid, um, how I am able to 
you know, have a pretty decent network. Like I love my network and if, um, I call them network, like, like, ooh, um, like I love my friends. I love solving problems. I love, you know, saying, Hey, like, that's great. Have you also thought about this? And I love it when people do that for me because I don't know what I don't know. So please tell me what I don't know or perhaps what I should be considering. And if it's something I do know at worst, I'm like, cool. Thanks. So let's, uh, let's cut to this. And I have students did well on this assignment and whose questions start off saying, I have a question about the CPA way question. Then what was pretty awesome is the question perhaps started with the CPA question and then involved other bits and bobs of other videos and brought it back. So for example, you know, um, somebody was talking about the CPA way question, how they answered it, what their debrief was, and then said that they really aren't sure what the difference between retractable and redeemable is that it felt pretty much the same. So perhaps um, it feels like it's the same because it is, um, you know, the shares that are um, being able to be purchased back by the company. But the difference is who is initiating them. So if it's redeemable, it's at the uh, discretion of the company. And if it's retractable, you know, that's at the discretion of the investor. So I think these are really good things uh, to bring up, especially when you're making your summary notes, which I suggest for each chapter, and really summarizing key definitions, and then how do these key definitions uh, interact with key topic areas. So understanding the definitions are like the building blocks, and then seeing how these weave together. So some really, really great questions. And in fact, I want to point out that the last part, the advice, um, a few things on this, a number of people said that they, um, they, they got the question, the advice wrong, putting that in quotes, because it wasn't the same as the advice here. People, your advice is your ability to provide value to your users. As we'll discuss with Nikki in just a moment, um, adding value to your users is not predefined, you know, and what they need and what you need to tell them. That's a professional judgment. That's the muscle that you are building. So your answer absolutely could be demonstrating competency and doesn't, especially in the advice, need to match up with what is said here. Now, we'll say this particular advice is very, very in tune with what parts of Nikki and I's discussion about your FAQs in part. Um, we actually chat a lot about um, career development, but part we cover some FAQs and one of them talks about the fact that preferred shares are, in this instance, are liability and substance. And they were actually just because something might affect the debt to equity ratio. Uh, there's ways in which um, you can work with certain players and certain users. So it doesn't need to always impact the debt to equity ratio. So we have a lot of, we kind of continue on this conversation because it was the most prevalent and frequently asked question question within the CPOA debriefs. All right, without All right, hey Nikki, we're recording now. Uh questions, questions. So, let's start off with why would I refer to you as the intro leading up to this video as a certified badass? I don't know, you know, I was wondering, <laughs> we might have some different opinions on that. I think you refer to me as a certified badass because I care. I'm very passionate about what I do. Uh, if I'm not passionate, I'm probably not going to do it or I'm not going to do it for long. Uh, also, I think I am a good team player, uh, which you are too. And I think you respect that we are similar. We're very different people in a lot of ways but we work well together because we are both invested in what we do and we are not satisfied with status quo or with good enough. I would say we both have that idea of a relentless pursuit of not perfection, but almost perfection, at least improvement for sure. Oh yeah. We're, we'll definitely won't take good enough. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. It's it's funny. So yes, yes. And, uh, one of the reasons why I think you're a badass, I think two kind of examples come to mind. I won't kind of share the exact examples, but one is more, it's not only that you hold yourself to a high standard, but anything to do with candidates, you hold others to a high standard too, and you won't apologize for it. And you'll 
say whatever you need to uh, to them, to whomever is listening. And I respect that. Um, you're never out to criticize. You never say anything that you wouldn't be okay being said to you. And you are the same person, regardless who is in the room, uh, who is listening. And in this day and age of, um, you know, we work with thousands of people. That is a badass, my friend. That is a badass. The other reason is because your, your life and your career parallel that as well, right? Mm. So there's, there's traditional paths and a lot of our, like a lot of the students, a lot of our candidates that we see, a lot of the students that I see at Dell, uh, there is a very, you know, prescribed path. And I'm, you know, after the merger, even before the merger, but after the merger, I, I, I see so many paths now. And I think that it's so important that people, you know, with focused intensity, you know, if they see something, they work towards it and they don't let others keep other people's opinions discount um, their own work, their own thoughts. And when I hear, oh, well, there's so many jobs in this, and there's so many jobs in that. I'm like, how many do you want? And yeah. they're, like, they're like, I want one. And I was like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, I just read a stat the other day uh, that the half-life of mit, much, like, much of the knowledge that is up there is five years. So, wow. Yeah. So like if we are working towards something for the next five or 10 years with the current skill set and the current information, it's kind of like, well, could you imagine kind of mortgaging your passion and your life uh, for something that may very much likely not exist in five years? So like you're a badass because you go for what you want now um, and you, you don't apologize for it and you deliver. Nikki, always, you are the you are the post person. You deliver. So for so many reasons, and then some. You are a badass, and I just want thank to you. Know, that, <laughs> you know, like yeah, that a working professional CPA um, yeah, can be a badass. And uh, we'll get into a bit of your personal and your professional in just a bit. But this is part of my weekly debrief. So Nikki. Every week, uh, students, they have a bunch of work to do. They have pre-work. They have yeah. videos that they have to watch that have an MCQ or Q for each one. Um, they have uh, a CPA way question. So financial reporting oh, question that they must yeah. address in the CPA way. Uh, yeah. They spent the first, um, first week watching our videos, like watching our YouTube uh, videos from the CPA way question. Then they have a debrief. Um, so they have to say something that they did well in the CPA way question, um, something that they can improve on, and then um, give me a video question. So I compiled their video questions into these FAQs, and I wanted to bring one of the FAQs to you right now. Okay. Okay. So we had this one on convertible debt. The CPA way question was on convertible debt, and right up until this point, they had learned about liabilities. They had learned about long-term liabilities. And then the very last chapter prior to the term test, they learned a lot about equity. And when we learned about equity, we called preferred shares and common shares, shares. Yep. Then we had the term test, and now we're in complex financial instruments. So we got the, <laughs> it's complex. Uh, sometimes we smush things together. And the CPA way question, uh, ended up having the answer where it was called preferred shares, but it had so many characteristics uh, that substance over form, it was yeah. debt. Mm -hmm. And some people saw it because of pre-work and, and the videos. And then other people were like, yeah, okay, I get it. And I get substance over form. But like they had in their mind, debt, bad, mm -hmm. equity, good. So wouldn't right. a company always want to make it equity? So I don't know about you, Nikki, but what do you hear when you hear the term always in accounting? Oh, I think there, there's no always or very rarely is there an always. <laughs> it's always yeah. dependent on who your user and what your situation. So um, a fair warning, Sam did t give me a heads up about this question. So I've had a few minutes to think about it, but uh, not much which is fine. But I am going to talk about with my family's business. So my, I grew up in a small business um, and my family decided because it's a funeral home. And <laughs> so even though myself and I have two uh, brothers, another one, which is a CPA, 
we had no interest in becoming funeral directors. So my dad uh, and my mom and dad wanted to sell the shares, but they wanted, because they're from a small community, they wanted to make sure the community was well served when they uh, stopped after 40 years of owning the funeral home. So how did they do this? They decided they had two amazing employees and they decided that they would sell to the employees. And so how they did that is through um, a share structure. So whereby my parents had the prefer preferred shares and then these two employees um, were able to purchase the common shares. So in this case, it, the shares were structured for um, estate planning as well. So we know that that is uh, in this particular in this particular case, it's classified as uh, a liability. And I was also talking with my husband, who is a banker, because I said to him, like, what happens if you when you see um, inevitably preferred shares that are classified as a liability? Just wanting to know, you know, what sort of that that other mm -hmm. take? Thinking about a, a whole a whole host of users here. So first of all, let's come back uh, from the perspective of my family. They didn't need any outside financing. So for them, frankly, they didn't care. Is it classified as an equity? Is it classified as a liability? They said, you just do what we have to do. It didn't matter. So then that made me think, okay, what is the perspective uh, for a company you know, when it is classified as a liability? How does that impact from a banking perspective? Mm -hmm. So I asked my husband and he said, often what they will do is they will just get a postponement of debt. And so mm. that is just an agreement where the shareholder says, you know, we're not going to uh, redeem these shares at, for this particular period of time so that the impact on the leverage, the debt to equity covenant is not um, something that is so significant. Nice. Nice. Um, and that actually ties in really well. Thank you for giving that holistic uh, perspective. No, no, it's fantastic because students have often asked, well, can they do that? Or what about this um, as far as how sh any agreement is written? And it's like, yeah, this is a legal contract. People get clever. Like, how do you think derivatives kind of came to be? Is People got really, really clever of how they wanted to make things sound. And we as accountants are like, hey, how are we going to capture this um, and reflect the economic reality of the situation on these financial statements? So I love that deferment, that postponement of debt so that you get that alleviation from the debt to equity ratio. That's fabulous. Um, the other reason, so there's all these like pro con lists. And I kind of think back to like our, our CPASB, like debt is not always good in the sense that, or for me, equity is not always good because um, it can be seen as diluting, you know? Absolutely. And then uh, debt, Debt is cheap. Debt, debt is um, tax deductible. Uh, tax doesn't call you at night and ask how its shares are doing. <laughs> debt wants to get paid back. It doesn't want growth. It wants you to do like good enough to like pay them the interest and, and then give them their money back. So I don't know, little <laughs> pros and cons. Uh, yeah, never say never and <laughs> never say always. Never say always, absolutely, yes. And it depends on who your user is, absolutely. right? Like that's a fundamental, uh, PEP kind of, uh, I would not methodology, but a way of thinking is approaching. You can't lump every user into the same bucket because looking at a bank versus looking at my parents, looking at a public company, like those are all different users. They all have a different take on the financial statements and those impacts. So it's really coming down to like, how do you view this debt versus equity? Yeah. And that's another reason we had this one prop and we were switching off classrooms. And um, as he was coming in, he was like, oh, accounting, um, <laughs> you know, how do your students feel about like their, you know, accounting not, or um, like accounting being obliterated in like the next few years. Mm -hmm. And I won't say what he was teaching, but I was like, we good. <laughs> we good because we are teaching dynamic thinking. Um, we are teaching people how to think about thinking and, you know, the substance of reform and looking, scanning the environment and really looking at the users. Like it depends, it depends, it depends, it depends. And I don't know, there's a whole lot of steps that AI has to get right before I'm even worried about it being able to provide uh, sufficient software <laughs> for certain things, let alone replacing uh, thinking, breathing, you know, human to help advise you. So perfect example. Um, thank you so much for that. 
Um, okay, so I wanted to get into a question because you always have the most interesting perspectives, but now I wouldn't mind, could we get, and I'm very cognizant that I actually wrote Nikki into this for 10 minutes before we're about to do a training session. So we have a few minutes left. Can you provide me your bio? Like, who, who are you <laughs> personally, professionally? Um, yeah. I'll give you a quick rundown. Okay, so I was never going to be an accountant because accountants are boring <laughs> and they like numbers and they like, okay, this is what I thought. And they love detail and accuracy. And this is like, so not me. This is just not, I, that is not me. So uh, I fought and I have had like a path like this, very not traditional. Uh, I thought I was gonna be a nurse. And so I was all registered. I was going to be a nurse. And then uh, two weeks before I was supposed to start right out of high school, I was like, nope, I'm going to go travel the world. So I went to Australia. I was a nanny and I was like, taking care of people sucks. I don't want to be a nurse. <laughs> it was great. Also made me realize I want to have kids for like a really long time. So I didn't. I didn't have my first kid until I was 33. Um, it was great though that I kind of have had that path. So I came back and then I went into finance and I thought corporate finance is just, I thought it was very interesting. Uh, I started, and then I moved to Edmonton and I started uh, working for General Motors in corporate finance. And I realized really, really quickly that there just wasn't a whole lot of opportunity. I felt at that point in time, in essence, I was working for some old men who were just like, hey, Nikki, get, get, you know, you can do this. They realized very quickly that I could grasp things and I could do their work. And I thought, this is BS. Like, I'm never going to get to your level yeah. in that company at that time. And I knew that I needed, I don't want to say a shortcut, but I needed a way to propel myself from where I was to somewhere that I wanted to be. Because good enough, as you know, is just, is just not going to cut it. So I finally relented. My dad for years had been like, you should get your accounting designation. And my little brother was just in university and he had known he was going to be an accountant since the time he was like, I don't know, eight. Um, so we ended up going through our program together, believe it or not. And I fought it. Like I did not want to be an accountant. I actually went back to school. I thought I wanted to be a doctor. And I've told this to Sam before. I went back went back for a year and I killed it. Yeah. But I also realized I didn't want to be a doctor. So I just had to prove it to myself like I could do it. And then I was like, yeah, I'm good. So <laughs> it took me a hell of a long time to get there. I traveled the world in between. Like I've taken a really long path to getting there. No regrets. I'm so happy that I did get my designation. And now when in the workshops, I sometimes hear candidates say, um, to be a good accountant, you have to be a C in the disc uh, profile. Don't worry about that too much. It just means somebody that values accuracy. Basically, you have to be a certain personality to be an accountant. And I just say, uh-uh, that is so not true. If you want to sit there with spreadsheets and not deal with people, which is my little brother, he is an investment banker. He's a partner. He loves it. He always says, I don't like people. <laughs> we love stocks and spreadsheets. If that is you, guess what? There's a place in accounting. If you are somebody who wants to talk to clients or wants to work in education or wants to work in so many other areas, there are so many cool paths. Uh, so there, yeah, that was kind of my, the quick, quick version of uh, how I got there. Um, before we launch into your, your, like, what do you do now? And um, some, you know, you said first kid, how many kids do you got? I have two, boy two and a girl. Kids. Yep. And where's your home office? Where are you sitting right now? I'm in my home office. I am in my basement. Yep. And, and I have, it has been pre-COVID, pre-COVID 12 years, 12 years. Yep. Yeah. The um, best thing about my home office is sometimes not now, not this year, but every November uh, for a couple of weeks, it is at my parents' place in Palm Springs. Mm -hmm. And I have a really nice table where I sit outside in front of the pool and my home office has also been on a beach in Antigua. It was uh, like literally on buses, trains, in the back of Ubers, and on a beach for three weeks in Australia this Christmas. I worked all over the place. Sam has too. Uh, so yeah, I, I love my home office, wherever it may be. I love it. That kind of strikes us into our last question, one of our last questions, because I know we're getting close. 
Um, Nikki, if I had to make you define success right here, right now, what's your definition? Oh, that's a really hard one. But I think it would be doing what you want to do in life, which I mean, I'm doing that. And honestly, you, we all have to work so many hours. Work, work takes up a huge portion of your life. You have to do something that you love to do. Um, there's no point spending your life hating doing something. And that is what, that is what I want to do. I mean, for me, my goal is to travel the world with my kids. I literally just yesterday booked a trip to Indonesia. I don't know when we're going. It's sometime after COVID. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but the point is I have a plan and like, we're going at some point. Um, that is my definition of, of success doing like crafting your life in the way that you envision and doing the things that you want to do yeah so many times i hear my students every year and they have these big plans for their summer right right after they graduate right before they start work and they say these words well it's the last time i'll ever be able to travel for that long and i just think in my head and lots of times i say it out loud i was like bullshit or i challenge them i'm like why would you do that to yourself well i uh and it's like, no, like you, I have a student or a former student right now. And um, one of the best compliments I've received lately was he has a job in Toronto and then he asked to work remotely because he wanted to go to BC. And um, because his family's out there, like he had like some kind of free housing for six months to go live in like a millionaire's mansion or something. And right before he drove out, um, he said like this, I wouldn't have thought this was possible without you. Cause I was like, oh, like awesome. Like hashtag lifestyle design. He's like, I wouldn't have thought it was possible if it wasn't like without you and without the stories that you tell about like your friends and your colleagues. And I'm like, yeah, like get out there and own it. So that leads us into my last, last question. Any parting advice you have for these wonderful human beings, these resilient, um, thoughtful, intense, but awesome humans? Get your designation, get your CPA. Don't say you're going to go and get it in five years because it'll just be so hard to get back. Do it. It's going to take work. It's going to take effort but get your designation uh, because once you have it, it will open up so many doors. Even if you don't think that you're going to be a traditional accountant. I am not a traditional accountant by any stretch. Well, uh, again, your brother. My, yeah, your my brother. brother, right? Like he is uh, an investment banker. I know so many other people that are doing some really super cool things. And I think that this is going to crack wide open. There are so many opportunities like uh, Mark Carney, who was the uh, governor for the Bank of England uh, and who was formerly Canada's, um, why am I just losing this right now? Our, gotcha. our, uh, yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> right? Like he has said yes. that the opportunities that there are for uh, accounts that are working in climate change and like we're going to see mm. the impact of uh, sustainability climate change that is coming into our balance sheets that's going to be the huge next wave i personally have an interest in that so i think it's really cool data analytics i just think uh, yeah. restructuring like there's so many different paths um yeah and if it isn't the CPA necessarily, um, but it's, you know, a master's or it's something yes. to do with data or it's something that they feel like strongly in their heart. Yeah. Don't wait. Don't wait for permission. Don't wait for somebody to say, if you do X and Y, you will get Z. I know for myself personally, I have made the biggest leaps and bounds when people are like, are you effing stupid? And I'm like, well, I don't think so. I made all these things. Um, and I just know that I have a, a personal board of directors. Uh, Nikki is, <laughs> is on it. Uh, she's leading the charge. You surround yourself with people that inspire you, that make you want to be better. And so thank you, Nikki. You inspire me. You too. You same back. Like, it, no doubt about it. Sam does things that I told her you have to do something once a year that makes you want to poop your pants. <laughs> And she, I love that she took my advice. Uh, she gave me advice when I had my AI crisis. Um, it's a long story. <laughs> but basically what I did is I ended up investing, you guys, in so many Amazon stocks with some money I had set aside. And let me just say, that advice has paid off, literally. Can't beat them. Join them. All righty, exactly. we're going to head into a training session. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't want to just end the video like that, but rather I wanted to let you know about the significance, if you couldn't tell already, of having Nikki in my life. Uh, you'll see some socks 
in the middle of the screen there. Uh, avocados doing yoga. She, <laughs> she saw those and when we were doing a series of marathon training sessions across the country one year, brought them during one of the sessions and at the end said, I saw these socks and they reminded me of you. Uh, I was thoughtful, it was timely, and this is just one of the little things that are the big things. <sighs> we spend enough time and enough energy at work, and it's important to find your people, the people that will lift you up, will make you stretch and feel uncomfortable, and I truly hope that you stumble upon your own yoga socks people because it's been a pretty cool ride and at least one of the times um, one of the big times one of the times that i almost quit and ran away and turned the other way um, but i heard nikki's voice in the back of my mind saying do something that makes you want to poop your pants and i got on stage um, and i stretched my very limits of any, I was so far away from my comfort zone. My comfort zone died that day, essentially. I made a new one. I made a new one because I was surrounded by people who, who care. Find your yoga socks, people. Hold on to them tight. It's a fun ride, guys. See you in the next video.